so as, uh, as I was saying, welcome back to this, the first session um, of our conference, which has got off to a very promising start. I think you'll agree. And the title of this session is Pleasure and Artistic Versatility. Um, and we have uh, Richard Richard and Robert Louis speaking in this, in this panel. Um, Richard Dury is going to uh, speak first. I suspect that, as the saying goes, Richard needs no introduction to most of you here. And um, you may, like me, have uh, benefited from Richard's enormous generosity um, in terms of sharing his knowledge and his scholarship about Stevenson. He, he's one of the general editors of the new Edinburgh edition of the works of Robert Louis Stevenson and he founded the Robert Louis Stevenson website in 1996 and helped to start um, up this series of uh, biennial um, Stevenson conferences and the Journal of Stevenson uh, Studies of which he's uh, the consultant um, editor. Um, he's published in other are areas other than Stevenson as well, in the area of English historical linguistics. And um, he, has studied, he has published widely, obviously, on Stevenson, including a critical edition of uh, The Strange Case... No, strange not case. The Strange Case. Strange <laughs> Case of <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And um, he, at present he is preparing, or has actually finished preparing, um, two volumes in the Collected Essays series of Stevenson, which is a project that he is also um, supervising. Um, he has a, a title which is Short and Sweet, Stevenson and Charm. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Leslie, and thank you, Leslie and Nathalie, for organising this. Since I've organised two conferences on Stevenson, I know the work that lies behind it. Uh, uh, but it's also a great satisfaction when everything works. Okay, so uh, Stevenson and Charm. Let me just put my watch so that I know I'm going to speak for 20 minutes. What is it that makes certain places, works of art and people, so appealing? Why are we captivated by them and aware of present delight? And why do we remember them more than others? Charm is part of the answer to these questions. And charm, which is obviously connected with pleasure, will also give us an insight into the pleasure of reading Stevenson. It's a word that is frequently applied to Stevenson, both during his life and afterwards. In a review of his first book, the review concludes he has both gifts and promise, and one inestimable gift in especial, charm. Uh, this term, isolated so prominently at the end of the last sentence, is found an ag again and again in other reviews of the same book. And it continued so to be used. Barry begins his 1889 essay on Stevenson by including him among writers who pos possess an indescribable charm. The word charm is used frequently by writers and critics in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Aesthetic belletrist vagueness, perhaps? Well, rather than uh, take this uh, position of cultural superiority, I think it might be better to try to understand what people meant by the term at the time. There is one problem. Charm, nowadays, has lost much of its charm. Charming is usually used in faint praise, and charm itself is often seen as a mere tool of seduction or manipulation in phrases like charm offensive or charm the pants off. But it does retain some more positive meanings, and we can use these to understand how it was used at the time of Stevenson and afterwards. Charm is a quality of variousness, surprise, distinct individual identity that gives unexpected delight. It's found in the infinite variety of Cleopatra, in the varying childness 
of Mamilius in The Winter's Tale, in Hopkins's Dappled Things, and I would argue in the writings of Stevenson. Uh, variety is very important in charm. A straight road through flat fields has no charm. You will find it in a winding road of changing scenery and unexpected views. The person or thing of charm is not totally predictable. A hotel de charme will not have standard decor. <laughs> uh, we probably have an evolutionary advantage. Uh, there's probably an evolutionary advantage in variety, which gives us an opportunity for discovery. And surprise, if not threatening, makes us aware and conscious of the moment. And the attraction of a distinct identity probably reflects our own precious distinct identity. Charm resembles fascination, but fascination can involve attraction and repulsion, as in nightmares. Desire and fear, which is not present in charm. Fascination uh, can border on obsession, while charm is passing, like music. It's allied to lightness, which is another word that's very often used to describe Stevenson. Uh, lightness, both in its debonair acceptance of existence and in the attention to the patternings of form. Short-lived phenomena will have a fleeting charm. The charm of Venice resides in its variousness and in its impermanent beauty. Charm can also be associated with absorption in experience, a falling asleep that causes delight. In The Lantern Bearers, Stephen tells the fable of the monk uh, for whom 50 years passes as he listens to a few trills of a nightingale, a bird Stevenson calls an enchanter. You are charmed and lose yourself in a book, in contemplating a landscape, in conversation with a person of charm. Vladimir Jankelevich, the one r philosopher who has discussed charm, does so not in a study of aesthetics, but in meditations on the nature of time, continual changing, continually changing appearances, and the flow of experience. Beauty of static perfection lacks charm. And the inter interrelated concept of grace, style, and charm involve change, process, and performance, combined with variability and unpredictability. In 1863, Alexander Smith links grace, style, and charm in words that could be applied to Stevenson. It is Montaigne's style in the strange freaks and turning of his thought, his constant surprises, his curi curious attention, alternations of humour and melancholy, his careless familiar forms of address and the grace with which everything is done that his charm lies. There are two kinds of pleasure giving charm. Originally a chanted formula to control a natural, a natural event or a person by magic in the 16th century, it was extended to anything that controls a person as if by magic. Romeo and Juliet are both bewitched by the charm of looks. And the term continued to evolve from controlling to simply affecting by pleasure. We can call this passive or aesthetic charm. Then in the polite culture of 17th and 18th century France, Charme, possessed by a person, uh, was further uh, extended from a passive quality of delighting, as a landscape or music could delight. Charme became the ability, the positive ability, of gracefully pleasing. We may call this active or personal charm. The first examples in English of this latter use that I found date from the second decade of the 19th century. Most of the early references refer to women, which helps us understand why, in a man, charm 
continues to be associated with female feminine grace and empathy. A person with charm <coughs> uh, possesses social ease, gracefulness and empathy and pays attention to the other person but is not bland. He or she will be ironic, playful, to a certain extent unpredictable, ambiguous, even slightly daring, hence d dangerous, hence exciting. The person with charm does not merely perform for you, but involves you, invites you into unstructured play. He or she makes you feel more witty, more intelligent, more socially skilled. And it's the person you always want to sit opposite at the dinner table. Uh, actors and literary characters with charm include Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn, Shakespeare's Rosalind, and Austin's Elizabeth Bennet. As soon as charm came to mean the active art of gracefully pleasing, it influenced the meaning applied to works of art. Writing can have charm if it produces aesthetic delight, but also from the mid-19th century if it communicates in ways that remind us of interaction with a person of charm. Paul Bourget, in a book that Stevenson read with great interest, says, The word charm, so vague in its signification, is the only one which expresses, expresses the magic of certain works by which one feels oneself loved as by a person and which one loves in the same way. Aesthetic charm is an important concept for Stevenson. Indeed, he sees it as the essential element of beauty and art, reminding us of Jankelevich, for whom it is what turns lifeless canonical forms into beauty. Uh, Stevenson criticizes the artist who believes that technique can replace the one excuse and breath of art, charm. Uh, and in the essay on Fontainebleau, he defines the business of real art as to give life to its abstractions and significance and charm to facts. The complementary terms of charm and significance overlap with pattern and argument in style and literature essay, the style and literature essay. Pattern and argument live in each other, he says. And it's by the brevity, clearness, charm or emphasis of pattern that we judge the strength and fitness of argument. Elsewhere too, Stevenson links charm and artistically shaped form in complementary opposition to sig significance. In a Japanese woodprint, some of the charm of arabesque is added to the significance of representative art. The essay most concerned with charm and pleasure in reading is a gossip on romance. In the first sentence, Stevenson praises the pleasure of absorption in experience. In any anything fit to be called by the name of reading, the process itself should be absorbing and voluptuous. We should gloat over a book, be wrapped clean out of ourselves. He then focuses on the charm of incident and situation. The charm for the sake of which we read in childhood was for some quality of the brute incident. Narrative situations that gave keen and lasting pleasure made an impression and stayed in the memory. Stevenson does not forget the, aes the aesthetic charm of varied and ephemeral non-artistic phenomena. The first sentence of the Fontainebleau essay begins, the charm of Fontainebleau, it blow is a thing apart, followed by a catalogue of the varied, well, varied elements that give pleasure, although the secret is in things invisible, ephemeral and changing, the air, the light, the perfume and shapes of things concord in happy harmony. Uh, charm also resides uh, in unique identities. There is no square mile of Fontainebleau without some special character and Charm. About personal charm, Stevenson does not theorize, but ideas can be understood from his narratives. Here, the attraction of personal charm is always associated with ambiguity and with danger. 
The two female char characters of charm, the Countess von Rosen in Prince Otto and Miss Barbara Grant in Katrina, put the male pr protagonist in difficulty. And there are a series of male characters with charm that combine charm with danger. Alan Breck, Long John Silver, and the Master of Ballantrae. Prince Florizel is relaxed, polite, attractive, but also ambiguous. And Colonel Geraldine, uh, his, his ambiguity confirms the feminine aspects of personal charm. There was a feminine coquetry and condescension in his manner which charmed the hearts of all. Um, Stevenson's novel that is centred on the attraction and dangers of charm, of personal charm, is The Master of Bantry. The master possesses this quality, but his brother does not. James charms his enemy, McKellar, on the transatlantic crossing. And, cornered by Mountain and his men in the forest, he acts with the relaxed suavity and irony of a James Bond. McKellar comments, the charm of his superiority once more triumphed. Stevenson also refers to the, the relationship of personal charm felt with writers. Montaigne is the most charming of table companions and one of those writers who have left a sort of personal seduction behind them and retained after death the art of making friends. Reading Marcus Aurelius is like making a new friend and in Mentone in November 1873 he says I found here a new friend to whom I grow daily more devoted, Georges Sand. Now, let's see how these concepts of aesthetic and personal charm more clearly defined and focused can help us understand the pleasure of reading Stevenson. Aesthetic charm, in its surprise and individuali individuality, has been defined as the reality, however trivial, that leaves an impression. And we can see this not only in the pictorial moments in Stevenson's novels, David Balfour hesitating on the midstream rock, for example, but also passages that describe the elusive charm of what is beautiful yet ephemeral, changing and various, such as the entry into the lagoon of the Farallone in the ebb tide. The emphasis here is on fleeting charm, the changing light and colours, a momentary shadow touched her decks. The indefinable phenomena, some ineffable, faint, nameless hue. The surprising form of the island, difficult to comprehend. He tortured himself to find analogies. And the variety of phenomena, a myriad of many coloured fishes. The scene charms the narrated observer. Herrick stood transported. He forgot the past and the present. The reader, too, is charmed by the evoked scene and also by the rhythms and sounds of the language. Readers have found, especially in the essays and the travel books, a strong impression of an author with a charming personality. The review, one review of uh, Virginia Buspurisque talks of the peculiar charm of the writing, which invites us to participate in ideas and emotions. And accepting this invitation is like holding conversation with a writer of singularly luminous and genial insight. This charm is due in part to the author's playful interaction with the reader, not only in irony, but also in unexpected epithets, such as the de deliberate seasons, words used in unusual ways, the painter flatters the portrait, Words used with two meanings, a sedate electrician in an office, and words <coughs> that are examples of their own meanings. In the outlandish vocable, for example, where vocable, vocable is an outlandish vocable. Okay. Uh, right. This verbal practice can be compared to the unexpected return of the ball in unstructured throwing and catching play when you stand in a group there's no rules but you you're varying the way you throw the ball all the time in crabbed age and youth stevenson describes human life as a labyrinth 
with no centre and no end. Since we have explored the maze so long without result, it follows for poor human reason that we cannot have to explore much longer. Close by must be the centre with a champagne luncheon and a piece of ornamental water. How if there were no centre at all, just one alley after another and the whole world a labyrinth without end or issue. Here, Stevenson's alternations, like Montaigne, of humour and melancholy, of, of irony, change of voices, playful involvement of the reader, convey a distinct personal charm. In Stevenson's writing, aesthetic and personal charm combine. We are charmed by the art and the artistry, by the writing and the writer, we feel delight in the constant variety and the playful involvement with the writer. The arrival of the Farallone in the lagoon captivates with the variety and unexpectedness of aesthetic charm, at the same time as the occasional surprising, uh, even cheeky, world word choices, uh, outrageous breakers, mighty surplusage, remind us of the playful author. The surprises of the evolving scene here and of the evolving text remind us of adventure. And it's no surprise that Jacques Rivière in 1913 chooses this very passage to illustrate what he means by the roman d'aventure, the adventure novel. The variety, uh, changes and surprises in Stevenson are present on multiple levels. In levels of sentence and story, of tone, of language and the represented world, of syntax and unusual word choices. They reward attention and encourage the reader's participation in resolving meaning and perceiving constantly varied patterns of sound and sense. There are constant shifts in the Charles Gardner Verses poems between the voice of the child and that of the remembering adult and temporal and spatial focus shifts back and forward in many of Stevenson's texts, including poems like The Tropics Vanish. In this way, <coughs> Stevenson delights us with his charm, with his variousness, unexpectedness, changes and juxtapositions, including unexpected shifts to matters of life and death, undeniable reality and incomprehensible aspects of life. Belletris vagris, vagueness? No. Charm is by nature ineffable. It involves process and experience and emotion. Uh, the reader of of Steven the reader of Stevenson and one other thing oh no sorry, can I do that again? <laughs> Belletris vagueness <laughs> by no means. Charm is by nature ineffable and involves process and experience and emotion. And it's one of the things that makes life worth living. The reader of Stevenson is enchanted by challen the challenging experience of the text in time, by the varied and changing represented world, and also by relationship with the playful writer. Both kinds of charm, aesthetic and personal, and their myriad multiple variations, work together to create the unique pleasure and interest that we experience as we savour the works of Robert Louis Stevenson. <laughs>